My name is Lori Beck, and I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Insurance Network America. I'm also the current Chair of the Board of Directors for the National Association of Fixed Annuities. So I spent a lot of time in my two roles talking to annuity producers, and I know that many of you Hold on. And already, we just already have like our first little glitch here. Hold on. There we go. See, this is how I feel this morning. Sorry about that. Um, this is how most of us feel these days. You know, from politicians taking shots about you and the type of business that you're in to competitors taking out full page ads against annuities, all you needed were more barriers to servicing your customer. But in this year alone, two big regulations are here or are coming your way. And keeping track of it all can be overwhelming. We get that too. So today, we're gonna to try to break it all down for you in a way that we hope makes it easy to follow and provide you with some tools to help you going forward along the way. So today, we're gonna to cover two major regulations. We're gonna go into a lot of detail on the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Model Act Regulation. We're gonna cover the basics of the newest version of the Department of Labor Fiduciary Rule that just went into effect last month. And since I imagine what you really hope to learn today is what it means to you and your practice, we'll give you some additional insight along the way to help you better understand how to comply. <clears throat> So let me start by talking about the regulation that is most likely to impact you if you're in the annuity industry. This new regulation, the Annuity Suitability and Best Interest Standard, modified the Suitability Act that's been in place since 2010. It's actually been in the works for about four years at the NAIC and has finally come to a um, conclusion where the commissioners felt there was something that they could all agree on, at least for the most part, have common ground. So they put this model in place last year. And for those of you who are not familiar with how that works, model acts are created by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners to make it easier for states to adopt uniform rules. Once they're finalized, states can adopt them as they are, which Iowa, Arizona, and Rhode Island have now done or they can skip the entire thing and adopt their own, which is what New York has done, or they can adapt the model act to meet what they feel is more in line with their state objectives and adopt parts of the model act. But in general, what we tend to see historically is that states tend to adopt the model act pretty much as they are. So normally at least 50% of the states will adopt it just in its original form, and then some slight tweaks in some other states. As your state adopts their version, it's gonna be important for you to know the differences, but you should expect them to be fairly consistent with what we discussed today. So what does the Model Act do? Well, basically it added four new obligations on any new or any insurance agent writing an annuity. A care obligation, disclosure, conflict of interest, and a documentation obligation. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go over these four obligations and walk you through what is in the rule and then really give you some sense of some practical guidance on how to um, adapt these rules into your practice of selling annuities. So the first one again is the care obligation. And the rule states that when you make an annuity recommendation, you must exercise reasonable diligence, care, and skill to know your client's financial situation, their insurance needs and financial objectives, to make a reasonable inquiry into the various annuity products that meet those needs that are available to you under your licensing and appointment, and understand those different products well enough to make an assessment. One thing to note is that at one point, it appeared that they were going to make you know all of the annuity products in the market, regardless of what you were contracted to sell. And the good news is that it's very clear in the new final act that it's only those products that you are contracted to sell that you need to have a good understanding of. 
Once you've done a reasonable inquiry of all of the products available to you, it is expected that you will have a reasonable basis to believe that the annuity option you recommend will effectively address the needs of your client over the life of the product. Then it is expected that you will communicate that basis to the client so that they also understand the reasons for your recommendation. This all begins with a client profile, and it is also stated inside of the um, model app what it's expected that you include inside that client profile. So you're expected to know your client's age, family status, their current financial information, their debt, their income, their liquid assets to cover needs, both today and in the future. Their financial experience. So are they savvy with mutual funds, stocks, bonds, or are they very conservative? I mean, what do they know? Are they young? Are they older, more experienced? Because you're supposed to take that into consideration in your presentation and your recommendations to your client. You need to know their financial goals and their time horizon. You also need to know the source of funds to purchase the annuity with detailed information about the existing product if it's a replacement. And it's clear in the act that they believe that without all of this information, you cannot really assess the needs of your client today or in the future. So finding the right products, like I said, is part of this. So it's not just good enough to know your client, you then have to be able to show that you found the right product to meet their needs. And remember, they talk about you having a reasonable basis to believe that it will address the needs of your client over the life of the product. So it doesn't just matter that year one it looks good, you've gotta make sure that it looks good over the time that the product is in place. So this is where you're going to need resources to do the research. And this is where having a good marketing organization comes in. You know, marketing organizations like Insurance Network offer a lot of services, but market research and understanding what is available under your contracts or contracts available to you is the very core of what we do. So bring that profile to someone who can help you navigate the current products on the market and help you decide what might meet your client's needs. Also, consider offering the client two options and letting them choose once you've provided the differences to them. By doing this and letting them choose the one that sounds the best to them after hearing you walk through the pros and cons of each, it's harder for someone to later claim that you pushed a single product that put your needs over the client's needs. Now, side note here, I've talked to enough regulators to know that this is also a real red flag. Should they have a reason to do an investigation, which could happen in a lot of different ways. It could happen because somebody you sold a product to filed a complaint. It could happen because a beneficiary didn't like the product that you sold, and eight years later, they file a complaint. It could be that a competitor files a complaint. There are a lot of different reasons investigators get involved. But once they do, one of the things that the Department of Insurance investigators will do is look at your sales records. And if they determine that you have been selling a single product almost exclusively, they're going to dig deeper because their understanding from that is that you're not looking to the individual client's needs and instead you're looking to your own. Now, I understand we all get comfortable with a product that we know well, but you have to be sure you're doing a full analysis to make sure that the one that you're recommending to that client really is the best in their scenario. And then making at least a couple of recommendations can be a much better approach for you and your client going forward. The next obligation under the NAIC Model Act is the disclosure obligation. And it is probably the biggest change that you're going to see to your practice once your state adopts this act. Under the obligation, you must quote unquote, prominently disclose to the customer details that relate to your business and your professional information, including the types of products you're licensed and authorized to sell and which carriers you're licensed to sell them with. 
In addition, something that makes people feel very uncomfortable these days is how you're paid. Now, we're going to talk in a few minutes about the Department of Labor um, fiduciary rule, which has some different things with relation to disclosure that might be coming your way. But the good news is that under this particular one, it isn't, hey, I'm getting 6%, I'm getting, I'm getting this or I'm getting that amount of money on your annuity. What the disclosure obligation under the NAIC Model Act is, is just that you are paid a commission or a fee or both. <clears throat> so in addition to that, the model regulations disclosure obligation also requires you to have prior to or at the time of your recommendation a reasonable basis to believe that your consumer has been informed of all of the various features of an annuity. And I've listed nine different bullets here, everything from the surrender charge to the tax penalties to the fees associated with the product and the writers limitations on interest returns, potential changes in the non-guaranteed elements of the annuity, and market risk. All of these things have to be disclosed to your customer, and you may have to show that you had that reasonable basis to believe that they knew about these features. <clears throat> Let me go back to this just one more second. One of the things that we'll want to make sure that we do is to help you with those disclosures. And we do have some information coming up for you on how to get that to you. Again, two different disclosures. Because one thing to be aware of here is that the, the annuity carriers have a lot of documents associated with the application that will help cover about 80%, 90% of what's on this list, but not necessarily the things we talked about here which is where you're talking about your business, your conflicts of interest that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, we do have a disclosure form that can help you with that. I'll talk about just in a couple of minutes. Let me move on to the conflict of interest obligation. So the act states that the material conflict of interest is any financial interest that you would have in the sale that a reasonable person would expect to influence your impartiality of a recommendation. Good news is that cash compensation is not automatically considered to be a conflict of interest in this regulation. Again, we're gonna talk about the Department of Labor in a few minutes. They look at compensation a little bit differently. It's the whole reason for that entire um, new rule coming out it has to do with um, collecting commissions. But in and of itself, in this particular rule, cash compensation and non-cash compensation. So perhaps, you know, marketing credits that you get from somebody like us or other, you know, things that you get as a result of selling annuities, not automatically considered to be a material conflict of interest. So what is a conflict of interest? Um, <clears throat> well, here are a few. One is having ownership interest either with the company issuing the um, annuity that you're recommending. So, you know, easy would be if you're a CEO of the insurance company. Another would be if you have a significant amount of stock in that um, company. Other examples of potential material conflict of interest, which would be more common, might be, especially if you have a close personal relationship with this person, a personal loan of money, um, from a client, and this one a little bit more common, acting in the capacity of both an insurance agent and an attorney for the customer, or acting as an owner, beneficiary, assignee of the annuity, either being sold or um, indirectly. Now, here, these are not forbidden, but you have to disclose them to your client if they exist. <clears throat> the fourth obligation within all of this really relates to everything we just talked about, and that's the documentation obligation. And the documentation obligation is the one that is going to um, really tell the story of what happened with that um, sale. So this is a critical piece and hopefully something you're already doing because it can truly make all the difference in the world if you're ever investigated. 
it's really the key to it all. So whether you're using a CRM or other software program or have a written file, you must keep a record of your interactions with this client and what led up to the sale. You're gonna have to be able to document that you disclosed those conflicts of interest if you had them. You're going to have to be able to document that you had a reasonable basis for your understanding of why that annuity would be the best one for your client. You're gonna to have to be able to document that you did that client profile. And then you're gonna to have to be able to make that available to the commissioner of insurance, including verbal discussions. So, you know, writing notes about what happened in the, you know, the summary following when they left your office. Some states are going to require that this be kept forever. Others as few as five years. My advice to you is make the files, keep them complete. Make sure that they can tell the complete story of everything that happened with the client and be able to stand on its own and just keep it. Um, whether the state says only five years or not, I would hang on to it. These complaints can often come in, again, from beneficiaries. So don't be in a position where somebody comes to you seven years after the sale and you're trying to remember what happened. Won't play well for you and can make it really challenging for anybody to kind of help back you up in these cases. So here's some minimum items you have to have in the file. All sales materials used with the client notes regarding your discussions, their completed profile we just talked about, the product recommendations, both the one they bought and any others that you might have presented, and the basis or basis for the recommendations as well as their completed applications. Make sure you've got notes in there that are detailed enough to explain what happened, but not so specific that it can create additional questions about what happened or didn't happen. And I know that seems like a really broad statement, but you know, you want to make sure that the notes that you have in that file are accurate, complete, and truthful. But you know, sometimes less is more because your notes are going to be open for interpretation later. And they're going to be looking at your notes with hindsight that you didn't have at the time you made the sale. So I'm just trying to give you some cautionary tale there to again be truthful, honest, open, complete in your in your notes, but um, just be cautious. The other thing I would recommend is even if you don't make a sale, keep a file on that client, including a note as to why the client chose not to purchase from you if they told you at that time, and especially if you chose not to recommend an annuity at that time. If you looked at their scenario and you decided that either you know, their financial needs or their, you know, intentions or their objectives in retirement didn't match up with the products that you had, making a note to that effect and putting it in the file is helpful if somebody ever pulls 10 files and they see that, no, you didn't just sell an annuity every time somebody came to talk to you about a possible future financial plan. So my recommendation is that you get that in there, whether they, um, whether they buy an annuity from you or not. So um, I know I covered a lot of things with you. Sorry I'm going so fast. Again, just trying to um, make sure I cover all of these things for you in a way that makes sense, um, knowing that you're probably going to have some more questions. So a few things. Your state has or hasn't adopted the rule yet. What should you do? Well, guys, this is coming your way whether you're ready or not. So I would expect that by the end of the year, the majority of the states that we do business in, in other words, the majority of the states that you're in, will have a version of this model act in place. So my advice to you is these aren't difficult steps. You may already be doing all of these things already, but take the steps you need to protect yourself now and into the future. My advice for you to do that is really um, pretty simple. When this webinar is over, reach out to our team for some of the tools that we have available to help you. You know, we are an IMO that is here to bring you way more than products. 
we've got one of the most experienced teams in the industry. This would be my 22nd plug for my team. And I'll, and I'll give you a little bit more on them as we go later. But we are so fortunate to have an experienced team that gets this, that understands this regulation and how it impacts you, understands the products and the industry, and can help guide you through all of this. In addition, we have access to the National Association of Fixed Annuities Best Interest Toolkit. This is a comprehensive kit that will go into much deeper details than what I've just shared with you today, and also includes some sample client profiles and disclosures, a ton of information. So if you're like me and you really like to get into the details, let us know and we'll be happy to get that over to you. Um, again, great information great information um, to help you along the way. We also have annuity search engines and tools to explore products that aren't in our portfolio of products. So if you need to know what's out there, even outside of what we offer, we have some annuity, annuity search tools that can help you with that. And again, an experienced team to guide you. There's also a disclosure form called the Disclosure Form Accord 660. You could certainly Google this and get it, or just let us know and we'd be happy to get that for you. The Disclosure Form Accord 660 will provide all of those disclosures that you have to provide. So, you know, what types of products are you um, eligible to sell? Um, what are you licensed for? How many carriers do you currently do business with? How are you typically paid? How are you going to be paid on this product? Um, all of that information covered in that Accord 660. If you do have any material conflicts of interest to disclose, all on that Accord 660. And this document, whether you use this one, one of your own, perhaps one that a broker dealer or an RIA has provided to you, whatever it is, you do need to get it signed by your consumer at the time of the sale and into the file. So I would recommend that you get that in there. Um, make sure that if you don't have one already, you reach out to our team. Here's our phone number, our email address, but we're, uh, we're only about halfway done with this webinar, so don't go anywhere quite yet. I promised you that we would talk about two regulations today. Um, and you may be wondering, you know, how is what we just talked about different from the much discussed, talked about, Everywhere you go on the internet today, you're hearing about the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. Well, one is in its applicability. The rules we just covered are for all annuities that the Departments of Insurance regulate, including but not limited to indexed annuities. The fiduciary rule also applies to those products in some settings, but it really doesn't pertain too much to MIGAs or SPIAs. But it also expands its reach into other financial products. So it's a much broader rule that is going to impact a lot more people in a lot more scenarios. Another key difference is the Department of Labor fiduciary rule is focused on the source of funds used to purchase the annuity or other financial products. <clears throat> so, I called this the fiduciary 3.0 rule because it's really in its third rendition. It actually started back in 2011, came back with a vengeance in 2015 under President Obama, and went into effect in April of 2016. But almost immediately, multiple lawsuits were filed, including by the National Association of Fixed Annuities. And in 2018, the Fifth District ruled against the Department of Labor. And by then we had a new president. And so many thought that this would be the end of it, but it wasn't. In 2020, the Department of Labor announced their version, which was largely expected if they did come out with one to be very industry friendly, which it wasn't. And then a second surprise came when it was adopted by the Biden administration on 216 of 2021. So here we are now a month later and everyone is still in a bit of shock and playing catch up. First, because no one expected the Trump Department of Labor to come out with a rule that was this restrictive. And mostly because no one expected that it would actually go into effect due to how late in his presidency that it came out. But here is what we know today. 
On February 16th, this new prohibited transaction class exemption went into effect called Improving Investment Advice for Workers and Retirees Prohibited Transaction Exemption 2020-02. Without getting into the weeds, these rules, when taken together, prohibit fiduciary recommendations to plans, participants, or IRA owners that result in increased competition for advisors unless you meet the rules for exemptions. That really raises three issues. One is, what constitutes a fiduciary recommendation? Are you currently a fiduciary if you're out talking to somebody about a rollover? Second is, what constitutes increased compensation? And then the third is, how do you meet a criteria for an exemption if, in fact, it's determined that the transaction that you're conducting with your client meets their new criteria? Well, here's the challenge. No guidance has been issued by the department yet. They say that it's forthcoming, but we don't have it yet. The good news is they have also said no enforcement is expected until the end of this year. And honestly, I expect you may still see legal challenges as the industry has time to evaluate this new rule, compare it to the fifth district um, ruling, compare it to the old one, and really try to get a gut feel for what it all means. But, you know, um, this is the basics. This is the bottom line of what this rule does. It focuses on the fiduciary status of rollover advice. It takes the position that advice to rollover retirement savings from an existing plan to an IRA or to another retirement savings is fiduciary advice if it meets the five-part test that the department set forth in 1975 under ERISA. That five-part test means that if you render advice to a plan as to the value of securities or other property, in other words, an, an annuity or another um, vehicle, makes recommendations as to the advisability in investing in, purchasing, or selling those securities or other property on a regular basis, pursuant to a mutual understanding that such advice will be the primary basis for investment decisions and that the advice will be individualized to the plan. One thing everybody kind of held their hat on early on was this on regular basis. Because most of the time, if you're out selling a single annuity a single time, it was considered, even if it was a rollover advice, that that was not considered to be a regular basis. That that wasn't an ongoing you know, investment advisor who was working with the client on an ongoing basis for a financial plan. But what we have understood is that this new rule absolutely brings rollovers into this. And frankly, the fact that you talk to a client and say, listen, this is what I recommend that you do, and then you do your due diligence by following up with them later on to see how it's going, the fact that that alone could constitute the regular basis shows you that you have some reason to be concerned. Because the problem is that once you're a fiduciary, you're prohibited from receiving conflicted compensation. For example, commission. So you can't earn a commission for those sales unless all of the criteria of the exemption are met. And again, we don't really even fully understand all of the criteria under this new exemption that just came out because again, Google it and you'll see everybody is like, this was the biggest surprise of the century. Nobody expected it to be released in December. We thought everybody was highly distracted with the election. And then once it came out, it fell within this 60 day window of his presidency ending, which meant nobody thought that it would go into effect. And it did. So what does it really mean to you? Well, again, enforcement not expected until 2021. But we do expect that you are going to be affected because in their preamble, they state they expect you to show you've taken good faith steps to comply with their impartial conduct standards and work in the client's best interest. 
Now, if you paid any attention to the Department of Labor fiduciary rule before, you might recall something called the PTE 8424 disclosure. It is different from this new disclosure that just came out. But there are a lot of people a lot smarter than me that believe that we can still use PTE 8424 for insurance products and perhaps variable annuity sales. And so a lot of the discussions that I've been hearing are around the fact that insurance carriers are saying, look, we may go to our agents and say, instead of complying with this new rule to its full extent, let's carve out the ability to receive commissions for annuities under the PTE 8424. So what is that? Well, a PTE 8424 disclosure for those of you who may not recall it, is a disclosure you have to give to the client, which defines the nature of your affiliation with the insurance company whose contract you're recommending, any lamentations on the product, the sales commission. Now in this case, for the PTE 8424, in addition to saying I get paid a commission, you actually have to give them either the percentage of the commission or the, the amount of the commission, and any charges, fees, discounts, penalties, or adjustments under the contract. So really a full disclosure of the product and how you're paid and what your relationship is with the um, insurer. Now, you can probably see that in many ways, this is not that much different from the disclosures that the NAIC came up with. And that's no accident. The NAIC initially drafted model language in an attempt to write rules that would regulate their products and many hoped that by incorporating many of the things the Department of Labor wanted in their last rendition, the DOL would leave insurance products alone. But that doesn't appear to be the case. So the good news is that there are still many elements of the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule that are not in this newest one. And so, you know, we don't know yet really what's going to happen with all of that. But what we do know is it's not as bad as the old one. It looks like the 8424 might be a workaround if we need it. I don't know how many of you remember something in there called BICE, but BICE is gone in this one. 8424 is still an option. There may be other ways to comply with this big one, but again, a lot can change between now and the end of the year. So I know I just threw a lot of information at you really fast, certainly not my intent. Um, Want to be mindful of your time, and, and truthfully, I could spend an easy hour going over just simply the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. And the problem and the challenge with doing that is that it could change a lot in both directions. So I mostly wanted to give you just a snapshot version of what it is, give you enough information that you can start protecting yourself and protect, protecting your practice and keeping you um, along the line. I promise that as we learn more, know more, get more information, as the new guidance is released on the new fiduciary rule, we will be back in there and we will spend an entire hour teaching you everything that you need to know. Meanwhile, what should you be doing today? Well, again, it's our opinion that you, if you do the things we talked about today with respect to the NAIC Model Act, taking a comprehensive client profile, getting to know your client's needs thoroughly before making any recommendations, seeking to learn more about the products that are available to you, seeking outside the box as needed, you know, not necessarily the products that you're most comfortable with, but making sure you're familiar with really everything that's available to you, because not all clients need the same product, so don't fall victim to your comfort zone. Once you've made a recommendation, and again, really recommend that you recommend to, walk them through, let them choose, Provide them with the disclosures, including the one on how you're paid. And again, under NAIC, you don't have to disclose the dollar amount in most states and in most cases. You can choose to, you don't have to. 
one thing I didn't talk about before, but it's important to note, there is a provision that says that if you have a client request specifically how much money you are paid on a product, you do have to tell them. But the NAIC Model Act disclosure only requires you tell them how that you're paid. And then document everything you do. One thing I would tell you as well is that we do have some carriers that are coming out and auditing cases after the fact to make sure that you have those NAIC disclosure forms in place if you're in states where it has already been adopted. So if you are in Arizona or Iowa or Rhode Island um, or in one of the states that starts adopting these very, very soon, we've heard that are about 12 that are on the cusp of adopting this model act. Don't just say you got the disclosure. Be sure you got it. Be sure it's signed. So if you need that disclosure, reach out to us. We'd be happy to get it to you. Um, again, get that best interest toolkit from us. It's got a pretty good client profile. If you don't already have one, um, talk to us about what we've got available to you. Um, this is our team. Together, these four individuals have over 45 years of experience helping agents in the annuity life and long-term care space. We would normally be answering our phones with a friendly voice right now, but COVID has made that harder. So these are their extensions. If you're already working with them, just call our 800 number, enter their extension, um, ask them to reach back out to you to help, um, reach out to our office and, and hit you know, zero for our general delivery mailbox, leave us a message. We'll be happy to get somebody back to you today to get you more information, or you can email us. You know, at Insurance Network, we are more than a product provider. We are here to help you. And I think those of you who are on the call that work with us every day can attest to this. We put service and support as our first priority for you every single day. So let us help you. I, I hope this information was helpful. I hope I didn't go too fast for you. I know it was like learning by fire hose, but that's why I've got a great team and great resources and great support to back all of that up. Um, we won't have time for questions today. I'm sorry for that, but what I would encourage you to do, shoot your questions to info at insurancenetwork.com. We'll make sure we get back to you, provide those questions to you, and again, a lot of the answers to your questions could be in some of the resources we have available too. So Tom, Austin, um, anything that I forgot to cover before I, I sign off today? No, Laura, you covered it all. Well done. Again, if you need those materials, um, give us a call. We will be following up, but if you can't wait, um, you've got the number right there and we are here to help. Well, again, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody. I know these are just really trying times, you know, um, between the pandemic and the pressure on your businesses and just the general anxiety that exists in our, in our entire country. There's never been probably a more challenging time. And I, I would reiterate what Tom just said. We are here for you. In, in our organization, you matter. So whatever it is that you're facing, whatever challenges you're trying to navigate, please let us know how we can help. And um, we would be more than happy to step in and give you any support and guidance that we need, whether it be you've got an annuity prospect right now you need some help with, or if it's life, long-term care, employee benefits, um, or help navigating all of this craziness coming your way. Insurance Network is your advocate ready to be here to support you. Thank you for your time today. I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you.